Roll call. I'll take that here. Baldwin, he's excused. Berg, here. Bonet is excused. Serta. Here. Groff. Here. Excused. Manny. Here. Montemayor. Perez. Peterson. Here. Rindfleisch. Sagali. Here. Stefan. Van Akron. Here. Vanderweely. Here. We have seven right now. Eight and seven total. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of. Oh, I'm sorry. Alderman Warner. No, you don't. There is no, there's no action being taken, so. Correct. Okay, then I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the October 11th meeting. Yes. Okay. Because we don't have a form, we should really take action on the minutes. So we can still have a presentation. Eight out, of, eight out of 15 is a quorum, isn't it? You're missing one alderman. Yes. <laughs> that, that's what Steve. That's what Steve told me last time. Yeah. Okay. The minutes have been approved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Contrary? Okay. Tonight's uh, presentation will be on municipal problems and it'll be, the presenter will be Mr. Ed Huck. So I will turn it over to him immediately. Mr. President, members of the council, thanks for inviting me. I wish I had just all kinds of wonderful news as you enter into your budget session or you probably up your years in budget already. Um, but it's gonna be another difficult year as you all know, the budgets are going to be tight. In fact, around the state we have uh, around half of the Alliance members having some difficulty meeting expenditure restraint uh, uh, quotas in order to get the, um, the uh, incentive from the state dollars to keep spending down. Um, it's been a very difficult year for a lot of cities. Health insurance has been a major cause for, uh, for the dilemma. Uh, very large increases. I think the average is around 17%. My understanding is that you've been fortunate enough to keep yours uh, under 15%, but nonetheless, it is still going to be a very difficult year. Uh, we don't really know what's going to happen with state shared revenues for 06 yet, but at least for the 05 budget year, you will remain uh, fairly constant to last year. Expenditure restraint, however, is a different story. Uh, there were many more communities qualifying, and although you have not received your estimate, there's a high degree of probability it will be less than it was the year before because there were so many communities that were actually um, uh, qualifying for the expenditure restraint. I'd like to start to talk a little bit about what you might expect in this upcoming session and some of the difficulties. The, um, the new majority leader and the speaker announced uh, uh, their first 100 days of the upcoming session, which as you know starts in um, January of 05. Technically, they'll go to the floor in February. And in the first 100 days, one of the things they talked about was a, was a tax freeze, a property tax freeze. Once again, the discussion will be about property taxes. Now, the unfortunate uh, discussion um, about just property taxes uh, is that a great deal of the problems that you folks have is the fact that your state shared revenues has not increased at all but once in the last decade and uh, we have no expectation, and now they were cut in the last budget go around by $70 million. We don't know what will happen. Right now, the administration is estimating a $700 million shortfall for the biennium. Um, it, that's a minimum. It could be as high as a billion, but we don't think so. 
but when you consider you need around $450 million for K-12 education, we've got a $1.1 billion problem again. And even if the governor cut state uh, government spending by 10%, which is his goal, uh, that will only take care of about half the problem. So we don't know what will happen in the 06, but for 06 year for you folks, but it does not look um, especially promising at this moment, although the, the administration contends they will do everything possible not to cut state shared revenues. The, uh, the tax freeze is likely to uh, pass in the first 100 days of the session. Um, it is likely to be vetoed by the governor, depending upon how the election turns out. In November will determine whether the governor's veto will be sustained in the houses or not. So we really don't know where any of this is going. Um, and we'll know a little bit more after the elections in November. In terms of the constitutional amendment, um, it is unclear at this particular time that there is consensus as to what this constitutional amendment should look like. There was a Senate proposal at the end of the last session. Um, it was um, poorly written. It had major problems with it. Um, beyond just uh, poorly written, the very concept of putting uh, uh, tax policy in the state's constitution is a critical error, no matter where we look uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the problem. But I, I just want to point some things out. We really are not in a property tax crisis in Wisconsin. As much as we hear this constantly from politicians, it really is more of a diversion from the fiscal crisis at the state level. It is really the fiscal crisis at the state level that remains to be a problem. And I can assure you that no constitutional amendment that has been proposed up to this date takes care of the state's structural deficit. So if you remember, right before our economy crashed, the state returned $700 million in taxes. Anybody remember this? It's a, we might have vague remembrance of this. Um, credits back to folks right before the economy crashed, and then we had a $3 billion deficit problem. Included in that was a structural deficit. In other words, spending from one budget was being pushed off into another budget in order for the, uh, the legislature to quote unquote technically balance the budget. The constitutional amendments as being proposed, at least in the Republican Senate in the last session, did nothing to take care of the structural deficit and in fact would have allowed for credits that go back to whoever the legislature chose to give those credits to. Could be homeowners, but you know what? It could be their favorite business pack. Uh, we don't really know. And in fact, that's the case in Colorado. It's been more of a give money to our friends type of a scenario at the same time they were devastating um, uh, the government in, in the state of Colorado. But let me just give you some statistics that you should know. School property tax rates have fallen nearly 50% since 1991. That, that's very significant. The property tax burden, and, and by the way, I'm taking these statistics from uh, uh, Professor Roshofsky at, at La Follette uh, Institute. The property tax burden on a medium value house um, has fallen since 1994 in terms of household income. It was 6.4% of household income in 1994. It is now down to 5.1%. When you take Wisconsin's high taxes and you include fees for services rendered, Wisconsin's burden falls to 15th. We go from 3rd to 15th when you include fees. Uh, also, it indicates that we have dropped from 6th to 12th in terms of total tax burden, although my understanding is that, that this data is old and uh, 2002, and so it, it, it could be updated, it could be different. But in terms of spending, and this is a very significant point, in Wisconsin, though it is third in taxes, is 18th in state and local spending. So we are not uh, what we consider to be a high spending state. In fact, we're 3.8% above the national average in spending on state and local taxes. So what I'm pointing out is that 
the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, the constitutional amendment, is really more political than it is policy. And worse than putting fiscal policy in the Constitution is to put politics in the state's Constitution. If, if you think about the debate over this constitutional amendment, what they've been saying is, well, you know, we always give the public the opportunity to, uh, to uh, uh, pass a referendum to go above the controls. This is not democracy because we already have. I mean, our forefathers created representative government. You folks are here because of representative government. The, the, our forefathers were smart enough to understand that people needed to be experts about how government runs and, and, and the expenditures. They need to have full understanding. And the general public doesn't have that level of understanding. In fact, the reality of it is, if you think about your municipal elections, in the face of low voter turnout, in the face of full knowledge about every issue that you folks deal with, money dominates the issue. Because state law is no one, the city cannot advocate for a referendum. It's illegal for the city to advocate for a referendum. So only those folks outside the political arena can have a say so. And money will dictate that almost every time. So what you really have is a concentration of power through the, con through the Constitution. The essence of democracy is choice. And the constitutional amendment does not fit the smell test when it comes to choice. Because it takes choice away from local government. It takes choice away from people in a very real sense. So we are going to continue at the Alliance to educate uh, folks uh, about the uh, Taxpayers' Bill of Rights and what it's meant. We, we, we know what it's done in Colorado. Right now, the state of Wisconsin's university system, especially in Madison, has, has gathered some of the largest federal grants in research and development in the high-tech industry. Colorado was kind of going in that direction, but they've been devastated by the taxpayers' bill of rights in Colorado, and the university is almost a private university today. But to give you some statistics between Colorado and Wisconsin. Health insurance coverage, we're third in the United States. Colorado's 21st, uh, was 21st in 1993, they're 37th today. High school graduation, Wisconsin's seventh. Colorado was 31st in 1993, they're 47th today. Most livable state, Wisconsin, 13th. Colorado, 8th in 1993, 23rd today. Healthiest state, Wisconsin, 21st. Colorado, 9th in 1993, and has dropped to 27th. Colorado continues to, to go down. Wisconsin has been stable. It's very important for if Wisconsin is going to compete in the international economy, it's important for us to continue to be stable. I want to talk a little bit about uh, real reform, but before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit about what you already know. Cities right now have been fighting in order just to stay competitive. Right now, tax rates and the disparity between cities' tax rates and town tax rates, uh, wealthy suburban tax rates, have been, uh, they've been growing. The disparity between wealth and poverty and where people live has been growing. This creates added burden. Two things we know about taxes. When wealth leaves one community and goes to another, especially in large numbers, it drives taxes in the place they're leaving, and it drives taxes in the place they're going to. So land use decisions by individuals have a driving of force on property taxes. It's something that growing communities have to deal with, and it's also larger older, well-established cities have to deal with. One of the things that you want here in Sheboygan is for all incomes to live in your city. You don't want to lose the middle class. You do not want to lose the wealthy. Um, 
You also have the problem, we, we would call it double whammy at the, at the Alliance of Cities, but what it really is, right now, the city of Sheboygan's property value makes up about one third of the county's property value. Now, some services you get from the county, um, you've, got, you've got the jail, you've got some health services, that type of thing. But an example, police services, you don't really get a lot of police services from the county, but you're paying for one third of the cost of the police that may be doing work in Kohler or in some town government around, this, around the city, and you're not really getting anything in value for that. This can be extended to a whole variety of areas, depending upon how active your county is in municipal services. But the fact is that when you subsidize services outside of your borders, you become less competitive for businesses and for residences. And this is a problem all over Wisconsin. Um, I don't know how you're dealing with your, uh, the cost of labor. Uh, you know, we've got mediation arbitration, which forces you to negotiate everything. We had a bill last session that would have allowed for the city to determine uh, how they provided service without negotiating it uh, with their labor unions. That got vetoed by the governor. Um, that was a problem for us. Now, as we face, I mean, 80% of your costs are, are associated with labor and, and the cost of labor, you're going to be looking at a whole variety of things from uh, opening up your contracts and talking about uh, uh, concessions, like virtually every city is doing in, in the state of Wisconsin, to potentially laying people off. Um, you ought to consider the possibility of demanding from the sheriff that instead of hiring another police officer, maybe what you ought to do is tell the sheriff, hey, we're paying one third of all of those costs. Maybe you ought to be providing some help within the city limits. It's something you ought to consider. So we have the tax rate disparities. We have the tax base disparities. We have county government giving municipal services to smaller communities of which this city uh, taxpayers are subsidizing. These are problems that we're trying to correct. Um, we have the problem with uh, 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 preempting of fees. Now, right now, as I mentioned, we could do a lot more with fees. And we could drop Wisconsin out of the top 10 in taxes had we the ability to create, uh, do more with fees. We've got an agenda, and I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of using fees. A big problem we've got, property tax exemptions. Every session, the state legislature gives away an exemption to a property owner um, that benefits uh, a few, and everybody else picks that up. Now, one thing that we absolutely know, since 1975, almost all of the property tax exemptions that have been given out by state government have impacted cities significantly greater than any other type of local government, because that's where the property value is. I don't care if it's machinery and equipment, line A stocks, theater equipment. You start going down the line, housing, there's a whole variety of exemptions that have been given out that have had an impact. We now have this uh, pending crisis on property. As my generation starts to uh, go into retirement, these retirement homes, I don't know how many you have in the city of Sheboygan, but what we have is a, a virtual crisis about to occur. Large valued condominiums are being built by not-for-profits or non-profit groups, and they are offering to take care of the elderly if they turn over large sums of money. So you've got these situations where um, somebody will turn over $200,000, $250,000 to a uh, uh, one of these uh, not-for-profits, they'll move in. And what has happened, they've been growing. They've been growing exponentially throughout Wisconsin. Our expectations is that they will double and maybe even triple over the next 10 years. And that means that those people who are paying the property tax, the people in their homes, those that are in apartments that cannot afford $250,000 to enter into these homes will be picking up the burden. There's a legislative council study on this right now, 
They seem to be bogged down and not moving very fast. We've got mandates. Mandates have been a problem in the past. They continue to be a problem today. Why? Because when you have to make choices about where you're going to spend your money, you know, you, you, you have to do recycling. So you're going to have, you can't make the choice between recycling and a police officer. You can't make the, the decision between recycling and a firefighter. Those choices are taken away from you. Every time the state government mandates something new down the city government, you lose your opportunity and your flexibility to make a decision about what is essential services in your city and what is not. And that's wrong. We continue the fight with mandates. So what are we going to try to do about this? Let's recap some of the things we're facing. A tax property tax freeze, which is not only unwarranted, it is absolutely political and we're going to continue to oppose it. And we hope that we can educate um, our legislators um, to, to not do this. I mean, we have um, the expenditure restraint program, of which all of the alliance members are participating in. We, as city government, is the has the best record in spending of any level of, any level of government over the last 20 years. Far and away, the most conservative spending group in government anywhere in Wisconsin and far exceed uh, the, the uh, spending differences between state government and local government. So we're going to try to talk uh, to the state about that. We're going to pose this constitutional amendment. We do not need uh, artificial um, spending caps and revenue caps in the state's constitution. The unintended consequences of this have been tremendous. You remember Proposition 13 in California? It's been about 20 years. I'll give, just give you an anecdote. My son, he's in his early 30s. He had two job offers in California. He went out, they wined him, and they dined him, and, and uh, he took one look at their school system. He's got a daughter that's 10 and a son that's 8. He took one look at their school system and came back home and said, you can't pay me enough money to have my kids go to the California school system. You cannot do that. And similarly in Colorado, where the school system continues to decline, the opportunities for everyday working people to go to the University of Colorado are diminished uh, daily because there is now no state subsidy for that university. So we're going to oppose that constitutional amendment because the fact is we need smarter government, not prescriptive remedies that are go well on a bumper sticker. But we also need reform. We need a lot of reform. We need to reduce the cost of government, and we need to do that uh, by, by looking at consolidating services with where we can in terms of other units of government. We need reform of our mediation arbitration. We need our unions to take a very good look at whether they are going to be uh, uh, holding on to their particular uh, contracts, because the reality of it is that in today's environment, uh, we must reduce the cost of government and we must get help from labor unions in order to do that. We need to reduce property taxes. We cannot continue to have freezes in revenue sharing. We got a plan for revenue sharing and I'll talk a little bit about that, but we cannot, you know, one of the proposals I heard was, well, we'll just give you a local option sales tax. Now, this is really remarkable because if you cut state shared revenues, which is state spending, going back to local government, and you give the local governments um, a local option sales tax, you know what happens? The state can spend more money. And, and Tabor doesn't say, the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights doesn't say that when the state stops giving property tax relief back to local government, that they can't spend it someplace else. They're just freeing up spending at the state level and giving taxing authority to local government. So what you actually have is more taxation, not less taxation. So the public needs to understand what's really going on here. This is, about, this is not about less taxes. This is about 
shifting taxes. This is about allowing the state to spend more even though they look like they're not. This is not what we should be doing in Wisconsin. We don't want a local sales option tax. We got other problems. You go to up, up the road to Appleton. Appleton is in three counties, but it's even worse is the shopping centers in the town of Grand Chute. So you give a local option sales tax, what happens? The town of Grand Chute no longer has a local property tax. Probably could subsidize half of their school system as well. And then Appleton's sitting there with a higher property tax and they lose people. You know, who wouldn't go to a, live in a place that doesn't have a property tax? People aren't foolish. They certainly will make those decisions. So we can't, we have to create a future with revenue sharing in it. We need to reduce property tax. We need to reform government in, in, in many ways. We have really a 19th, government, 19th century government system, and I'm talking mostly about town government. We need to try to figure out how we can uh, merge services and deliver them in a more effective manner. And I don't just mean moving them to the county. Maybe villages and cities and even some towns can get together and work through some of these problems. Because if we're going to re revitalize Wisconsin's economy, what we need to do is have smart government. And smart government is hard work. It's not simplistic. There are a lot of barriers. There's labor barriers. There is turf barriers. There are a variety of barriers. Does it mean we shouldn't try it, that we shouldn't do it? No. But I can assure you that if we pass a constitutional amendment in Wisconsin, the ability to move services or to combine services will be gone. Because that constitutional amendment will lock into place 19th century government in Wisconsin, and we will never be able to get to smart government. So we're looking for a variety of regional problems. But we've got some other issues, health insurance. The Wisconsin Alliance of Cities has endorsed uh, the AFL-CIO proposal on health insurance. Now, I don't expect you all to be uh, experts, but you need to take a look at this. We saw the actuarial report that was done on their proposal. This is good health insurance. This is not Cadillac health insurance, but it's good health insurance. It's good for families. This insurance, if you follow the employer plan, it's an employer plan, not a government plan, it's an employer plan. This system would reduce cost to about $300 per employee per month. Now, right now, the Alliance of Cities is paying anywhere from 950, and these are old numbers, between $950 per employee all the way up to $1,400 uh, per employee. Our estimate is that if it were implemented today, the taxpayers in Wisconsin would save $800 million in state and local taxes. $800 million dollars in savings to the taxpayers of Wisconsin if we reform health care. Some might ask the state legislature, what are you waiting for? So health care reform. We need some changes in mediation arbitration. I cannot tell you how difficult it is to combine services or to get out of the 19th century government box that we're in unless we have some changes in mediation arbitration. I've got three cities that 25 and 30 years ago lost in arbitration cases where they had to pay the insurance premiums for the retirees. These three cities, I'm not going to name them, could be in receivership before the decade is over because their retirement workforce is as large as their actual workforce. And just moving people into retirement doesn't help their problem with health care. So we've got the health care problem, and we've got the mediation arbitration problem. We need to do something with it. We've got a couple of proposals on mandates, where we are mandated as cities to do things that other governments are not mandated to do. It's small stuff. But we pay a gas tax. Every City, town, village, and school district in a state pays the state gas tax. Now, what sense is it 
to have the property taxpayer pay for uh, higher tax, have higher taxes because we pay the state's gas tax. One level of government taxing another level of government. It doesn't make sense. Um, we would like to actually see some definition of the responsibilities between counties and cities and villages and towns. Why? To eliminate redundancy of services. In order for, to make sure that the citizens, the taxpayers in Sheboygan don't pay a property tax to the county and then have the county provide services to everybody except the citizens of Sheboygan because that's the current law. We want to eliminate that. Uh, and we've got a variety of proposals to do that. We want to, uh, want to do, uh, pursue regional revenue sharing. Now we've got a proposal. Now this is just to kind of explain where we were. The old formula for state share revenues has not run since 1999. So we really don't have a revenue sharing plan. But what we're not talking about is reallocation of any of that money. We're gonna use that as a base for the future. So no city, town, village will lose um, any shared revenues because of a new formula being uh, developed. What we're talking about is creating a base year. Now the legislature could choose this year, and if they did, what shared revenue spending is as a percent of state taxes, general taxes, is 6.3%. So what we're saying is carve out that 6.3% for the future. 25% of that new money would go as a percent increase to all levels of government, uh, barring none. But then we create a regional focus. Now this is what's different, and this is, uh, this is quite unique. What we'd be saying is that the general fund revenues raised in the county of Sheboygan would stay in the county of Sheboygan and would be shared on a need basis. But what this does, your regional economy is the county of Sheboygan. You are a metropolitan statistical area. Uh, people who live in the county work in the county to the greatest extent. What we're talking about is for those revenues to stay in the county and be uh, distributed on a need basis for municipalities with, with rates of three mills or greater. So if you're under three mills, it's kind of hard to say you're a needy community when you have a mill rate of about three or less than three mills. It's, it's either because you're very wealthy or because you're just not providing services. Either way, you don't need a tremendous amount of help. But the idea is that all local governments within Sheboygan County would be more concerned about building the regional economy and working together than working apart or between each other. We want to be able to build cooperation to grow the economy. Because the fact of the matter is, one of the major reasons we're a high tax state is because we have very low wages. And part of the reason we have very low wages is because we're tied very gr greatly to manufacturing. Now you might think in terms of manufacturing being high, high wage, a high wage industry, that was the case in 1970. It is not the case today. High tech, biotechnical types of, uh, of uh, companies pay three times the wages, three times the wages that manufacturing pays. We are changing in the world economy. Our vision for where we're going needs to be a little bit different. So we want all local governments to work together to build their regional economy. And if they do, then the corporate taxes and the income taxes that go up in the county of Sheboygan will be shared by all local government and you will share in the, the new economy and the new vision. So, we're going to be trying to push this agenda at the state legislature to deal with the problems. To actually, we, we know what the problems are of city government. We've known them for years. We cannot regress away from that fight. We know we have land use problems. We know we have 
separation of income problems. We know that we have a state legislature that just loves to give away your tax base while they keep their tax base. We know that politics, partisan politics, is the way of the land today and that we have to deal with that in some manner, but we cannot just roll over to partisan politics because the problems uh, that the cities face are about delivering public safety. You know, every family wants the same thing, right? They want, they want good schools, they want safe streets, they want the, their, everybody wants a chance at a good paying job, they want good health care. This is, and, and everybody wants this. It doesn't matter what race, what, what ethnicity you are, what religion you are, you all want the same things. And cities play a role in that. Why? Because cities, cities are the only level of government that are part of the economy. State government, artificial lines. Did he deliver services? other than one of the lousiest prison systems in the state of Wisconsin, where the spending is out of control, three times higher than the state of Minnesota. A little bit of subsidy to the University of Wisconsin. The state doesn't do much. They don't do anything. Counties, artificial lines. Those lines were drawn in the 1800s. They haven't significantly changed in, in 150 odd years, more than 150 years. They're artificial in their nature. Towns, artificial boundaries. Just a way of measuring uh, uh, government, so to speak, back in the 19th century. But cities, cities are dynamic. And they grow because businesses need space, they need to grow. They grow because this is the place where jobs happen. These are the, the flow of people and the flow of commerce is because of cities. This is where it happens. So unlike any other level of government, instead of the state trying to impede what cities do, they ought to be turning over greater local autonomy. They ought to be trying to help them grow because in the end, that's what makes the state grow. So although you have these problems, you also have the greatest ability to impact the people who live in Wisconsin. And it is an honor to represent those people. And you know, our forefathers created representative government. They were geniuses. You know, they, I don't know if they saw 10% turnout at the polls in a municipal election. I don't know if they first saw that. But if it were not for the republic that was given to us in the 1700s, where would we be? This is the greatest nation on earth because we are a republic, because of representative democracy. And, and the thing to remember is this, those legislators, are accountable to you. That's what representative democracy is about. To you and your neighbors and the citizens of this city. They're accountable to you. They don't tell you what to do in the real sense unless you're willing to give that power over. So we've got a really tough couple of years ahead of us. But the thing about it is, you're on the right side of the equation. You're in the place where it matters. It's not partisan politics. It's about growing your economy. It's about giving services and keeping your citizens safe. So the Alliance of Cities is going to try to help in that effort. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions about something that I said or didn't say. Um, and uh, most willing to discuss it with you at this time. So. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Huck? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. He was Maryland's mic here for a moment. Uh, first of all, a, a comment and then a, a question. Uh, the uh, health plan that Ed alluded to, the AFL-CIO plan, 
There is a presentation at uh, Mead Public Library on that by Tom Newby on David. David Newby, I believe on November 4th at 3 p.m. In, in the Roka Room. Uh, for anyone who's interested in that, I think as Ed alluded to, it's a kind of an exciting proposal that's going to spread the uh, cost of health insurance amongst all employers and would reduce our costs substantially. Uh, then second point, just a, a question uh, for Ed. Um, I think as you alluded to, shared revenues have at best been frozen for the last decade, decade and a half. And I, I, if I recall correctly, um, Sheboygan, Sheboygan, use, Sheboygan counts on shared revenues. I believe we are the third, uh, third largest, how would I phrase it, third largest user of shared revenues in the state of Wisconsin. It accounts for well over 40% of, of uh, our revenues. Looking into your crystal ball, because the state is on a different fiscal year than we are, how the, the second payment in 2005 for shared revenues, how is, is that, does that look stable or will we have a problem with that? I ask this because we're in the midst of budgeting right now. Yeah, I, I, you're, you'll be fine with it. Um, but it's part of the structural deficit. The reason state shared revenues is uh, frequently targeted by the state legislature. I talked about this structural deficit of pushing out spending from one of their budgets into their next budget. If you look at the state structural deficit, about half of that structural deficit is state shared revenues because that second payment. Now, you got to go all the way back to 1985, Tony Earle and the last time we had a crisis in Wisconsin. What they did to help pay, uh, to balance the budget in 1985, was they shifted that shared revenue payment out of the 1985 year budget to 1986. And they've never changed it in 20 years. And so over a period of time, that second payment is hanging out there, um, asking to be cut in the times of, of fiscal crisis. That's why uh, then Governor McCallum took a look at it. But let me just point out what shared revenue, you're talking about 40%. You lose your state shared revenues. The local tax rate here in Sheboygan will go up $6.15 without any new spending. That, that's the significance of it. Now, I don't know where you are, but imagine you're somewhere around Ten, eleven dollars in your local rates. So there's your, there's your impact of it. Uh, your 05 payment is secure. I have seen no scenario where that'll be a problem. 06 is another manner. We still have a structural deficit. We still have an actual deficit to deal with, and uh, we don't know what the recommendations are going to be at this particular time. <coughs> Many. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question relates to uh, your influence in the capital today as the Alliance of Cities. Uh, we can help you as we are informed and clear ourselves in lobbying our own representatives. Um, how effective are you in your educational process and your lobbying and in your own reading of the situation today? Well, we educate on two levels. Um, I have a uh, communications director who spends virtually all of his days and hours communicating with uh, other levels of government and the public in general about what's happening in the state legislature because people um, need to understand the issues. Um, and, and, and we do that uh, we have a newsletter for, for everyone listen, here and listening. If you go to www.wiscities.org, we have a website and we have a newsletter that changes on a regular basis about what's happening in Madison. So we update and educate a whole variety of folks in the business community and the private sector and in local government. In terms of uh, the Alliance of Cities and our lobbying, uh, we have a contract lobbyist, Jim Tenuta. Jim and I share, actually share office space. Jim is the former 
uh, caucus chair for the Senate Republican Party. Um, he's a, uh, his expertise is in politics. And I need Jim because I live in a political world of partisan politics, which happens to be dominated in the legislature by Republicans right now. And we have in place a political strategist and someone who uh, uh, works very closely with the Republican Party. Uh, myself, um, as a lobbyist, I have a very good relationship with a lot of legislators. We are, the Alliance is honoring six legislators, five Republicans and one Democrat. Um, across the state, I have two awards left to give. We have uh, uh, Representative Wickert from Appleton was Legislator of the Year. Uh, Senator Stepp from Racine was Senator of the Year, both Republicans, and both um, urban folks who work for cities on behalf of urban families. But I can't take political positions. And so um, where the alliance stands is on public policy. Now public policy in a political world sometimes seeps through and it sometimes doesn't seep through. So we have to have a, a political strategy, we have to have a political entity, and we have to have somebody who stays on the, the straight and narrow when it comes to public policy because in the end, it's the public policy changes uh, that advance the health and well-being of the citizens that live within cities across the state. So uh, we are incrementally successful. I have never uh, had, well, that's not true. I've had a couple of outstanding budgets. Uh, last session, we had the best tax incremental uh, finance reform ever in the state of Wisconsin that will allow for cities to invest in their downtowns for 30 years in a way they've never had that opportunity before. So we have our incremental successes, and, uh, but I can tell you this, if you don't have lobbyists working for the interests of urban families every day at the state capitol, you would have a situation like Oak Creek uh, incorporating and surrounding the city of Milwaukee like in 1950 when we didn't have lobbyists in the state of government. You would have your annexation powers ripped away from your city in no time at all, and you would see uh, uh, a decline like you've never seen before. Are we effective? Absolutely. Is it always visible? No. Are we going to be successful on an ongoing basis? Yes, but it will be incremental. Seeing there are no further questions, Mr. Huck, I'd like to thank you very much for coming tonight. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Now I entertain the motion to adjourn. Second. Motion made and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Contrary? Okay. Thank you.